Hello, everyone. Um, good evening, afternoon, or morning, wherever you may be. Just let me know if you can hear me clearly. Um, just uh, to let people later know, uh, people who are watching the recording, uh, that uh, I usually start about 10 minutes uh, before uh, the scheduled time to have a chat. So if you don't want to listen to the chat, if you're watching this uh, afterwards as a recording, uh, jump about 10 minutes forward, nine or 10 minutes. Uh, we're going to uh, cover today, while well, the title of the live stream today is Central Bankers Market Rigging Are to Blame for Past and Future uh, Crises. So that will be the main kind of topic to start out um, in about nine minutes time. Uh, prior to that, I'll just say hello to everyone. Joker Alpha says the volume is good. Uh, I've seen the, the Prashant Schumer is here. Marek Kalenda is here. Uh, Spock 2024, Niels uh, Han Dynasty. Urban Sombrero says, good evening. Chris Jones, Spock 2024. N Neku Soren says, uh, greetings from Romania. If you come and visit, I will show you the vampires. Yeah, they're uh, King Charles' uh, relatives or ancestors, I, I think. Um, <laughs> so King Charles uh, III. And H says you need a portfolio of shiny coins. Francesca Masso says, good evening from Scotland. Good evening, Francesca. Collapse of Fiat Urban. Spock 2024. Good evening, Mario Billy Bullion. Hope you're well. Yes, Manic Minor, we're well. You can see, yeah, you can see, got a clear view of Billy today. I, I changed the camera around. I think it's better like this. Uh, who's a Jew? <laughs> uh, who's a 313? Markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's difficult to stop stacking. I agree with you, Ant H. East Coast History Hunter. Anonymous is here. <laughs> Anonymous. Quite a few of you, I, I will try my best to answer your questions. You can start asking questions now uh, if you want, but uh, it's difficult sometimes when you get a lot of people uh, and, and uh, it scrolls through the, the messages fairly quickly. Uh, great, Nate, greetings, uh, Mario, sick of central bank interference. Yeah, that's all they do. Their excuse is that they're a lender of last resort, but... Uh, <laughs> We, we don't need central bank monopolies. We, we, we have to let banks fail and businesses fail. We've been bailing uh, uh, banks and businesses for too long. And that, that's the problem. We don't really have a free market. Alex Morgan from Wales says, hello, Mario and Billy. Music lover forever. Did you see the review of your interview by Market Snipers? Uh, yeah, I, I did. Well, I didn't watch it, but I saw the thumbnail this morning. I haven't watched it yet. Uh, he, yeah, he's going to be interviewing me, I think, uh, Wednesday. He uh, approached me, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before. That, yeah, that interview is gone. Uh, I mean, it's doing really well. <laughs> I usually don't get, I think we're going to go up to 50,000 views, which is unusual for me. Uh, just to let people know, Clive Thompson, uh, he told me it was the first time he did an interview like this on social media. He's a retired private banker. He's British, but he's English, of course, but he's been in Switzerland for about almost 40 years. And we're going to do a second one uh, in December 
because I think there's a lot of questions from the viewers and we're going to try to gather all most, you know, as many questions as possible and have Clive answer the question questions. And, and the other thing I would say about uh, his idea that uh, we're going to see a reset and they're going to try to bring in CBDCs. That's just his opinion. It doesn't mean to say that I believe in that. And it doesn't mean to say that I think CBDCs will succeed ultimately. But uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's gone very well, that interview. Uh, John M says he, he loved the interview of CBDC guys. Uh, yeah, it's just speculation, as I said. You know, there's many, many things that could happen. Ideally, <laughs> Hopefully they won't succeed in bringing in a CBDC. And if they do, I think it will fail personally. William uh, PMCD says your set is attractable. The same simple green screen setup might add interesting angle. Well, if I put a green screen, <laughs> uh, Billy won't be part of the show, but... Um, I think I've done it like this most of the time. I, I could do something. I could uh, put a screen on. Uh, I'll show you guys. Let's see. But uh, I, I don't think it's really, uh, let's see. I can choose. Let's have a look. Background. I can put another background. For example, I, I could I could put the Golden Gate Bridge <laughs> behind me. Um, but uh, anyway, there you go. <laughs> Um, uh, Matt Bittner, did you get any good deals in the 2008 crisis? Um, not really. I mean, <laughs> at the time I was working in the city still, did I get any good deals? Well, I think I've been, I was tacking all along, uh, even when the markets were down, um, silver, like in 2008 and some gold. No, but I, I didn't really, I mean, it was very difficult to get any good deals because the central bankers interfered. If they hadn't interfered, uh, maybe uh, I would have been able to buy a property, but uh, they pumped up everything again. So it's very difficult to get any good deals. That's, uh, <laughs> that's what we're gonna be talking about today, how central bankers don't like uh, they want to see the market the way they they think is best. They don't want to see uh, banks go under. They don't want to see energy companies go under. We've we, we seen that uh, bulb was uh, bailed out here in the UK, and we're going to be paying for it, the taxpayer. Anonymous says FTX must have been doing that losing 80% in a day is a common with options or leverage. Uh, I, I think FTX is... <laughs> Uh, FTX is supposed to be an exchange, so, but they had a, a hedge fund linked to it, and the hedge fund apparently was taking uh, funds from the clients, like the FTX clients. I think that's what happened. Is uh, we have to wait and see, but I can't say for that. It looks like it could be a fraud. I I need to be careful legally. It looks like a complete scam. They stole customers' money. And then I think uh, faith and confidence in the operation was lost when the Binance guy sold his shares, his uh, tokens, FD tokens, and then everything collapsed. It was a big uh, Ponzi, I guess. They were taking uh, clients' money and, and speculating with it. Alex says, smash the like buttons. Maricolin says, uh, Brazil football team number one. To be honest, I haven't been watching the World Cup. Sometimes I check the results. I'm not really too interested in the football anymore. Maybe if Brazil get, gets uh, to the final, I might watch it. Or if England gets to the final. Um, echo, echo, I thought Thatcher wanted to do away with the nanny state. So how come? Uh, all the bailouts. Well, because they got rid of Thatcher in 1990. That's why she didn't have enough time to do it. I think um, there was a coup, just like there was a coup recently with, uh, what's her name, Liz Truss. 
and am I saying Liz Truss was doing the right thing? Uh, difficult to say it, but at least she wanted to cut taxes and have the economy grow. My criticism of that plan was that they didn't uh, come and say, we're going to cut the size of government as well. And that investors kind of lost faith uh, with that. You know, they sold the gilts, sold sterling. But in a way, maybe that would have been a good thing for, for sterling to keep going down and gilts to, to go down. Uh, but the Bank of England, of course, they, they had to come and intervene. Uh, someone's asking about uh, Archbishop Vigano. Yeah, uh, uh, for, uh, yeah, there you go, Cupid stunt. Yeah, I saw on, uh, someone posted it on, uh, on Twitter, his speech about the um, World Economic Forum and the globalists, he actually called them the uh, international mafia. I I've known about Archbishop Vigano for the last, well, two years. He's been pretty, um, yeah, he's been exposing the globalists and what we've seen in the last almost three years now uh, of this um, move to uh, fourth industrial revolution and Klaus Schwab's uh, great reset. So I guess we're all here now, or most of us. Um, the title of this live stream, Central Bankers Market Rigging are to blame for past and future crises. So the reason I'm, I'm, I wanna talk about this is because You, I think you, I think lies are always exposed <laughs> and uh, yeah, lies always come, you know, it might take a long time for lies to be exposed, but eventually they do. <laughs> and uh, I think it was Jean-Claude Juncker. He, he was the president of the European Commission at one point. Uh, and he's known to, his quote was, when it becomes serious, you have to lie. And I think uh, there's a story that came out uh, this weekend, and it's actually in the FT. And it's not a huge story in terms of getting a lot of coverage. It's mostly for people like us who look into these things. So it's this one here, cracks in LIBOR's reckoning. Were traders criminals or scapegoats? Uh, and it goes to say, after a series of US court rulings, Tom Hayes is trying to appeal against UK convic conviction for rate rigging. So what it looks like is that the US courts are saying, well, this is not fraud. You know, this is not a crime. But this trader, Tom Hayes, in the UK, he's been convicted and put in jail for, I think, 11 years for rigging LIBOR. And uh, I personally think they are, they're being using as this here, as you can see, scapegoats. And why do I say that? Well, <laughs> here's where um, central banker rigging comes into play. And I'm gonna bring you up uh, some articles, some old articles about the LIBOR, uh, the, <laughs> the original rigging, because some people will argue, well, the rigging uh, that uh, Tom Hayes and other traders did, that's separate from this. But uh, I think it's just a distraction because the biggest uh, rigging and conspiracy, and this is from July 2012. This is from The Independent. <laughs> and they even say the LIBOR conspiracy were the Bank of England and Whitehall in on it. So this is uh, Bob Diamond, of course. He's, he was the CEO of Barclays. And this is the deputy governor of the Bank of England at the time, Paul Tucker. And this is an 08. And the story goes that the, the Bank of England basically uh, also at the behest of the UK Treasury uh, force kind of uh, gave uh, <laughs> Barclays a nudge saying, how come you're setting these LIBOR rates so high? And uh, Barclays saw that as an instruction from the Bank of England uh, to um, manipulate the rates. And I'm going to talk a little bit about LIBOR fixing and what it is, because I actually, one of my biggest clients, he used to do the fixing for the dollar, uh, three month uh, LIBOR. Uh, so I'm aware of what happens there. 
Uh, so another story here, and I'll share it with you. This is from 2017. Uh, and it's the same thing about the Bank of England here. Let me, uh, there you go. Bank of England, this is 2017, uh, independent again, implicated in LIBOR rigging scandal by secret recording of BBC reports. So what happened here? Well, this is a recording uh, between uh, a senior Barclays manager, as you can see here, uh, Mark Dearlove, and a LIBOR submitter. He's the, the banker who submits the, the LIBOR rate, and I'm gonna come to what it is in a minute. But uh, this is what Mark Dearlove told Peter Johnson. Uh, the bottom line is you're going to absolutely hate this, but we've had very serious pressure from the UK government and the Bank of England about pushing our LIBORs lower. Uh, Mr. Johnson has heard objecting on grounds that this would mean breaking the rules for setting LIBOR, which required him to put in rates based only on the cost of borrowing cash. And this is what he said, this uh, LIBOR setter. So I'll push them below a realistic level of where I think I can get money. <laughs> uh, and his boss replied, the fact of the matter is we've got the Bank of England and all sorts of people involved in the whole thing thing. Uh, I am reluctant as you are. These guys have just turned around and said, uh, just do it, right? Um, how did the B uh, Bank of England get away with it? Well, um, <laughs> they, they, they said that, uh, I think it was uh, Paul Fisher and uh, Bob Diamond, they were the ones on the phone or or to that effect, but uh, the Bank of England said that they never gave instructions. But just to talk about the fact that uh, your, I think what the Bank of England said was, oh, how come your rates are lower than everyone else? You know, it was a bit like a nudge. And that's how they got away with it. The serious fraud office investigated the Bank of England and they said they found nothing. So my hope is that, um, What's happening now with the LIBOR cases in the US is going to open Pandora's box. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, they'll get away with it, unfortunately. But yeah, central bankers, uh, they're the ones who manipulate the most things. So now I'll, I'll go back to uh, having a look at some of your questions. So you, what you've got here, we've got St. Louis 9 is around. Uh, So greetings, uh, Mariam Billy, Mr. B. He's a moderator. Thank you, Mr. B. Yeah, so a little bit on LIBOR. LIBOR means the London Interbank Offered Rate. And uh, after World War II, when the dollar became the major reserve currency, there's a lot of dollars sloshing around in Europe because of the Marshall Plan. And these dollars were traded uh, mainly in London, the London market, and they still are. Uh, are they they issued uh, outside the, the dollar system? No, <laughs> it's the dollar system, but offshore. We also have the Euribor, which is the Euro system offshore. Uh, we have Japanese yen, uh, Euro, Euro yen uh, issues as well. It's just uh, uh, when currencies trade abroad, but basically the, the LIBOR rate is very important because it's the uh, rate that banks would lend to each other overnight or for a month, three months, six months, or maybe a year. And with no collateral, it's just a loan amongst banks. So what happened in the 08 crisis, uh, all the banks were collapsing, as we know, if they hadn't bailed out the system uh, and banks wouldn't lend to each other anymore. So the LIBOR rate spiked massively uh, and, um, no one trusted each other. And, uh, and basically LIBOR rates are, they're fixed. So at 11 o'clock London, so they call the LIBOR setters and say, where is your three month money? And, and they just give you an idea of where they could uh, borrow, uh, borrow money at, they say four and a half percent. 
and then they'll call another bank. They'll say four and three quarters, four and a quarter, and they make an average, and that's the fixing. And uh, the fixing is very important because it's used for mortgages in the U.S. Uh, in the dollar market. It's used for for everything, uh, for, for derivatives as well. A lot of times when they're doing interest rate swaps, they'll say, "Well, uh, I'll pay you this plus six. I'll pay you six month LIBOR plus fifty basis points." So it's a huge market. It affects, uh, at the time, it affected like uh, 300 trillion in loans, credit card, mortgages, car loans, but also I would say over a quadrillion in derivatives. And that's why it was so important. So what the Bank of England uh, and the Treasury uh, seem to do in the UK is say, you guys need to make it seem that the banks are in better shape. <laughs> and eventually, of course, everything imploded uh, and they're just trying to hide, to lie about things. Of course, they I can't really say they did it, but uh, it, it smells, it smells. <laughs> and uh, so intervention, yeah, the, that's the Keynesian uh, fallacy that Central bankers uh, and central banks need to intervene in the market. And with that, I'm going to recommend a very interesting book. It's more academic. You can get this uh, free PDF if you go to the Mises.org website. And it's uh, America's uh, Great Depression by Murray Rothbard. And what's it got to do with uh, central bank intervention? Well, it, it talks about the the 1920s, why there is the Roaring Twenties. And uh, I'll read uh, the inside jacket here uh, because uh, the Keynesians especially used the, uh, the crash of 29 and the Great Depression that ensued to say that the free markets didn't work and that governments had to intervene. And uh, I think uh, Roth Rothbard does a great job in uh, countering that argument. It says here, uh, from the introduction by Paul Johnson, the Wall Street collapse and the Great Depression, which followed, is, followed it, were among, among the most important events of the 20th century. By undermining confidence in the efficacy of the market and the capitalist system, they helped explain why the absurdly inefficient and murderous system of Soviet communism survived for so long. For half a century, the co conventional orthodox explanation provided by uh, John Maynard Keynes and his followers was that capitalism was incapable of saving itself, and that government did uh, that, and that government did little to rescue an intellectually bankrupt market system from the consequences of its folly. And uh, this is what it says about Rothbard. Rothbard wrote, uh, Rothbard produced in 1963 his own explanation, which turned the conventional one on its head. The severity of the Wall Street crash, he argued, was not due to the un unrestrained license of a free booting capitalist system, but to government insistence on keeping a boom going artificially by pumping uh, in inflationary credit. His book is an intellectual tour de force and has stood the test of time with success, even with panache. So yeah, I think on page 142, uh, there's a section uh, about helping Britain. And uh, what, what did, how did that affect the uh, Roaring Twenties? Well, Britain went back on a gold standard at too high a rate. It overvalued sterling. Uh, and um, to help Britain, the, the Fed actually pumped up uh, cut rates massively so that sterling would stay artificially strong. But what that did was create the real estate boom in Florida. It created the, the stock market bubble in the 1920s that culminated in the crash in 29. And, and the Fed hasn't learned the lesson because uh, most people won't read Rothbard. They'll read Keynes and stuff. They'll read Bernanke. And the Fed's been doing the same thing. Uh, we saw recently they opened their swap lines and, and sent billions to the, to the Swiss, Swiss National Bank. So it's all going to end in tears, unfortunately.
Uh, Tristan Jones, do you have any videos that discuss financial situation for UK banks? Like how safeguarded are they from rising interest rates? Well, all the major banks, uh, the too big to fail banks, they're all, uh, they're not safeguarded at all. They're very uh, fragile. They're highly leveraged. So uh, I would say, yeah, they have a $85,000 uh, pound, sorry, uh, insurance. But if there was a systemic crisis, the FCS, the FCSC, that's the insurers, the FDIC equivalent. I don't think they have enough assets to pay depositors. And that's why I've told, uh, I've been telling uh, my viewers for the last six years that uh, I don't think it's safe to keep too much uh, currency or credit. It's actually an unsecured loan when you keep money with the bank. Yeah, I don't think it's that safe. And that's why I think having uh, physical gold and silver outside the system is a good insurance. And I'll continue to do so. Uh, Matthew, Liz, one is so. Could you explain a little more the one trillion light switch for China? Yeah, that, that was from, uh, I interviewed uh, Alex Scanlon. He's the CEO of Barton Gold, a uh, small uh, mining company from Australia from South Australia, especially. Um, what he meant is that uh, just like they switched off <laughs> the Russian reserves after the uh, start of the uh, troubles in the Ukraine in February, they can do the same to the, to the 1 trillion uh, that uh, China has in treasuries. They can just freeze that. They did that to Switzerland in the during World War II, even though Switzerland was neutral. I think they, they froze about $200 million of uh, dollar reserves that the Swiss National Bank had uh, with the US Treasury. So yeah, and, and that's why uh, the move away uh, from the dollar is going to continue. Um, not because the dollar is really a, a, a good currency tra to transact, because uh, you can't argue that it isn't, but because they're using it as a, as a weapon, as a political weapon. And uh, that's why more and more people are going to gold. We saw that Ghana announced that they're going to be buying their oil. And they produce oil, but they have to import. They're going to be doing it in gold. And what they're going to do is uh, they they're going to tell the uh, well they're going to force actually the miners uh, in Ghana, which could be international companies, to sell twenty percent of the gold that they uh, mine to the government. Um, do I think that is right? Well, I guess if you're in the country, uh, you have to abide by the rules there, and I and it's not a, really a tax even though you could argue it's a tax because they're forcing them to do that. And I, I suspect they're going to be buying that gold in their local currency and they're going to use the gold so that uh, they don't have to get dollars. <laughs> Why get dollars when you, can, you, when you have gold and then you can use your own currency to buy the gold? Uh, so more and more people are doing that. More and more countries are also using their own currencies uh, bilaterally and um, and uh, circumventing the dollar. Uh, John M., uh, will you ever interview a Bitcoiner? I have interviewed uh, Bitcoiners in the past, uh, but uh, I don't really plan to, to do so because I don't cover Bitcoin and crypto that much. I spoke about FTX recently, but it's not. Uh, my channel is more about precious metals, commodities, hard assets. And I don't consider uh, Bitcoin a hard asset. So there you go. Uh, MM No says, I've mashed the like button and share. How about you? Thank you, MM No. But it's not to say that I wouldn't interview someone. I, I don't even know what a Bitcoiner is. I mean, I, I have uh, exposure to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Am I a Bitcoiner? No.
Robert Clayton, any news of the nearly discovered properties of silver that there are two types, one has amazing properties within its molecules. I hadn't seen that, uh, Robert Clayton. Uranium, uranium comments? No, I, I mean, I've got, um, I've got some uranium stocks. I think uranium royalty, I've got some. But uh, I, I, one thing I saw is that uh, in the last budget here in the UK, they announced that they're going to build a new nuclear uh, power uh, reactor, nuclear power plant. And I think uh, a lot of countries are going to move that way because it's clean, clean, clean energy. So I think in the long term, it's a good, it's a good uh, place to be. That's my, my view. A serious report, London Paul is well worth following to. Uh, he goes into the detail about geopolitics. Yeah, I, I interview him fairly regularly here on the channel. Uh, Paul from the serious report. Uh, no, uh, drink it. We don't, Mario, uh, Billy and I don't have any platinum uh, coins. Uh, Mario interview Max Skies and ask him when. No, I, I don't really. I mean, I used to listen to Max Kaiser during the day that uh, in the day, uh, like where he used to tell people to buy silver and like a stack. He was the first guy who says, let's stack silver, real physical and bring down the banks or JP Morgan. And uh, I, I met him actually in 2009 at a precious metals uh, conference. Uh, organized by the EFT of all people. One of my colleagues at work uh, got the invitation and he, he, he took me along with him and I met Max Kaiser and um, I didn't get very good vibes from talking to him, uh, to be honest. So I, I don't think I would want to interview him. That's just the way I feel. Uh, Alex Credit Suisse, are they the next collapse? Well, yeah, I, I saw, I haven't really looked too closely into that, but they lot of they lost like $83 billion in deposits. And I think that's why uh, the, the Federal Reserve had to send billions to the, uh, to the Swiss National Bank and the Swiss National Bank sent it to Credit Suisse. And why they do that? Well, because when, when uh, uh, people who have money with a bank uh, when they rush to get all the, their deposits out, <laughs> it's all went out. And they, uh, banks usually don't keep uh, <laughs> $83 billion in cash. And that's probably what happened. So, uh, yes, they're probably in trouble, uh, Credit Suisse. But I think, uh, again, the central bankers, they always disrupt market signals. And that's what we're talking about today, right? But I, I don't think it's just Credit Suisse that is in, in, in such trouble. It's all the banks, all the major banks. Uh, Pino Kunchner, yeah, uh, Francis Hunt discussed today your interview. Yeah, I, I saw, I didn't watch it, but I, I saw this morning when I logged into my uh, computer, the thumbnail telling me that he was gonna talk about that interview. Uh, he's gonna interview me as well on Wednesday. And, um, just wanted to say uh, as well, this interview with Clive Thompson is going very well, especially for my channel. It's got almost 50,000 views, which would be nice to get for every video, but uh, it went so well. And there's so many questions that Clive and I are gonna be doing a second interview sometime in December. And uh, we're gonna collect a lot of the questions that viewers have and try to answer them. Um, Matthew says the central banks could start the new money substitute through CBDC backed by gold. Yeah, they could back the, the system by gold. Um, if they do that, if they revalue gold and reliquify their balance sheets, uh, they they would be able to, yeah, maybe people would trust the CBDC. Uh, am I saying CBDCs are good for, for people? Well, 
if they were just like currency and and, and but the, that would be good but it, it, there's no privacy in cbdc and, and we know from like comments by rishi sunak when he was chancellor of the exchequer and the uh, managing director of the uh, bis agustin karstens that uh, they want cbdc's not just to make things more efficient but to control us and uh, that's why i think it's still important to have uh, as much outside the system um, liquid assets like gold and silver and any other thing outside the system than have having a lot of uh, fiat balances in the bank as clive said in the interview uh, if there's a reset they could close the banks uh, over the weekend and then on the next monday they could say your 10 000, your 100,000 pounds or 100,000 dollars uh, you can only take it out now uh, like 1% every every year or something, and they'll bring in, you have to use a new currency. So basically, uh, wipe out the fiat balances and bring in the new currency. Uh, I won't go too much into it. Uh, wait for my um, second interview with Clive, or if you haven't watched it, I recommend you watch uh, the original um, interview. Like one percent every sorry this is not let's uh i'll put the link here for that interview that is actually for me has gone quite viral <laughs> uh i think we've got we got almost fifty thousand views so i recommend you watch that carlos garcia uh, interview Michael Saylor, Kevin O'Leary. Well, <laughs> the problem with uh, what's going on is that um, there's two things going on. Yes, Bitcoin and the white paper might be an interesting concept, and I don't disagree with that because I, I remember looking into it uh, over 10 years ago, and I remember when I uh, traded Bitcoin and it was uh, about uh, $80 uh, per Bitcoin. But Michael Saylor and people like, uh, I don't even know Kevin O'Leary that well. I don't even know who he is really, to be honest. I think he's Canadian. But uh, the unfortunately, the crypto space has been infiltrated by uh, shysters, really. <laughs> and I don't like using that word. And I think that's what those two guys are and many others. And so was SBF. And actually, uh, Warren Buffett and uh, his partner, uh, forgot his name now, the other guy, <laughs> they, they said the same thing. And uh, I could see it coming already in 2017 when they uh, basically started the um, the futures contract uh, for Bitcoin. I said, well, the bankers have hijacked uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And, and I think uh, you can even find videos that I did about that. So uh, there you go. Uh, Echo Echo, do you see any solution to the housing crisis in the UK? <laughs> uh, yes, of course I do. It's uh, the government has to stop interfering. And what do I mean by that? Well, they got, got help to build, help to buy. You know, the, the Bank of England keeps uh, manipulating interest rates low. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the solution to the housing problem is that, unfortunately, they didn't let the housing market collapse in uh, after 08, 09. Well, it did crash, but they pumped it up again. And even uh, George Osborne came out, well, we had to do that. We had to do the QE to help uh, asset prices. So yeah, the solution is a total collapse, I would say, of the currency, the collapse of the system, and then uh, houses will go to their more fair value in whatever new currency or even in gold and silver that it should be. So the, the solution, people always focus on the fact that there's not enough houses, but I, I think it's more that um, uh, credit has been so 
plentiful and the government has done everything to help keep house prices high. And why do they do that? Well, because they get billions from inheritance tax. <laughs> and that's why they've kept the threshold uh, at around 325 for inher inheritance tax since 2009. And they're going to be doing it to, for one generation so, till 2028, 28, because they know a lot of the baby boomers, they're sitting on properties that are valued at like a lot and they're going to be getting a, a, a lot of uh, funds to to keep funding the UK treasury uh, so until the government <laughs> yeah there is no solution unfortunately uh, unless there's a collapse so that's all I could tell you about that <laughs> no echo echo it's they don't need to make more houses I've, I've gone through this compared to other countries. The UK doesn't really have too many people in each house. They have like very low, like 2.3 people per house. And another reason why there's not, there is enough houses, uh, I think in my opinion, but all these years they kept interest rates very low and they're still very low interest rates. They're even negative in real terms. People with money in the bank, they, they thought, this is, uh, I'm losing, I, I need to buy an asset. And they've done the buy to let. Uh, I don't think it's, a, I think it's more, uh, not a supply problem for houses. It's more uh, too much easy money and it's driven up prices too much. Uh, Susan P. Faust, yeah, they, they can't have an uh, inheritance tax for the royal family or else they'd lose everything. Um, they wouldn't be around anymore. It just goes to show how, yeah, there's no level playing field in the UK. Uh, did you know that all the, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, mo the royal family, all the aristocrats and like uh, billionaires, they own about 95% of all the land in the UK. And did you know <laughs> that uh, I think only 5% of the UK area is used for like residential homes. So maybe, yeah, maybe some land reform might help echo echo. <laughs> uh, I would say maybe you could be partly right, but I also think uh, they just try to keep uh, housing prices artificially uh, high interest rate artificially low. And it's another example of central bankers and governments interfering in the market in order to really line their pockets. Uh, ter Terrell Brath Brathwaite with a CBDC uh, backed by Silverwork. It's a medal for the new tech age. Um, I think if we go back to sound money, we need to do a bimetallic system. So backed by gold and backed by silver. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure though that, uh, yeah, I'm not sure the central bankers in the West want to uh, make their, the CBDC be sound money. They're using it more to be a, a control mechanism. They, I don't think the, and would you trust the BIS, the Bank of England, the Fed to really have the gold and the silver there? Um, yeah, I, I'm not too sure about it. Maybe the, uh, the BRICS nations, uh, the other, like China, Russia, and the other people, they might do something with gold and silver. Who knows? But, and that's why I still think it's really important to be your own central banker, to have your own uh, physical gold and silver. And um, as for CBDCs, I, I, I've always said that he, people who are self-reliant, who don't depend on the state and uh, 
yeah, have a steady income and do whatever you have to do to survive, uh, you won't be too dependent on the CBDC. We might have to use it, but it might be just for tr normal transactions. And I think the important thing is to try to keep your wealth out of the CBDC. We might even have to go into a world where we could uh, barter with, and I don't like using the word barter, but exchange things with people that want gold and silver without the government knowing it. And this might sound controversial, but uh, I think it could happen. Echo Echo, thank you for your super chat. Just to say thanks for the helpful discussion on my house question. Love the show, especially this weekly gathering. Well, you're welcome. Alex says wants to see 500 likes. Yeah, the likes help. Uh, Carl Sittler, is inflation in China over a thousand percent? I actually, uh, I mean, of course we can't trust any government with their CPI data, but I actually think the Chinese data is, below, is around 5%, the CPI there, who knows what, uh, the real number is. Joker Alpha, if one person owns all the Bitcoin, is it worth anything? Um, well, not really. <laughs> um, it wouldn't be that decentralized. I, I think gold is very decentralized. Uh, I know central banks and governments own quite, quite a bit of gold. That I think about uh, how much is it? Ten, about 17% of all the gold that's been mined. I think just over 30,000 tons. So 17%, they, they might be able to control the paper market still, but um, yeah, 83% is owned by non-governmental um, entities. So I would say gold is very decentralized. A normal norm, uh, Matt, need more content for the hour stream? Well, the other thing I do is I take questions because uh, a lot of times it's difficult to answer all the questions in my daily videos. Um, but I, I do have a few other things here um, to do with market manipulation. And one of them is uh, this article here. Uh, it was written uh, back in July. And this is about precious metals manipulation. And, and I think it's pretty significant uh, because Ronan Manley here from Bullion Star, he covers uh, Peter Hambro, uh, who wrote something early this year that uh, <laughs> the BIS and central banks are rigging the gold market using uh, paper gold. And why is it significant? Well, because Peter Hambro is from an important banking family. As you will read in the article here, it says, um, on top of that, Peter Hambro is also the great grandson of Baron Carl Joachim Hambro, the founder of the famous English investment bank, Hambro's. In fact, Mercado Goldsmith even merged with Hambro's in 1957. In the 80s, Mercado Goldsmith was also is the largest gold and silver counterparty to the Soviet Union. So he's been a, a bullion dealer in, in the London market. But this is what he says here at the end. And I think uh, it's quite significant because all manipulations and lies are usually, well, not usually, they're always exposed. It's just a matter of uh, how long it takes it to be exposed. And this is what he said, the paper gold emperor's clothes. Hambro then wraps uh, up his article by referring back to the recent uh, US OCC precious metals derivatives chart. So this is this chart here, I'll just quickly show that. So it just goes to show how the amount of uh, gold and silver derivatives went through the roof uh, in the first quarter of this year, right? Uh, so this is what he says, uh, straws blowing in the wind are often said to presage great tempests. 
And I believe that this chart, the one I just showed you, shows just uh, such a straw. Look at this chart and then uh, go see your bullion trading counterparty and buy some gold. Then ask for your gold and silver or platinum or palladium or any other physical store value and medium of exchange that you have acquired to protect you from the ravages of inflation. Yeah, inflation is not just the CPI. Inflation is the all the credit, uh, currency and credit they're creating. Uh, for inflation will surely engulf the world when the paper gold emperor's clothes are seen for what they really are. And then he says, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping are among those who know the golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. So it's the same thing for us uh, as individuals. If we have, if we have our own central bank, if we keep some uh, physical gold and silver, uh, it will make it easier for us to be independent and self-reliant and and I, I totally agree with that <sighs> echo echo i don't really know if there are machines or devices that can verify whether a silver coin is silver uh, i don't think there's much um, it's more a problem with gold but if you buy from a reputable dealer that's been around for many years i don't think you should have any problems Bill, you're still asleep. Silver is a stepchild to gold. And while there's a saying that gold is uh, the money of kings and then silver is the money of gentlemen, uh, fiat, fiat currency is the, uh, no, barter is the money, uh, the money of uh, peasants or farmers, and that fiat currency is the money of slaves. CBDC is definitely <laughs> going to be, uh, yeah, the, the currency or money of slaves. And it's not even money, it's just a credit. Scott, 49140, is it true that the Treasury has America's gold Fed claims? Yeah, the, the statutory rate is $42 and I think 21 or 20, like you say there. Um, and uh, it's valued on the Fed's balance sheet at $11 billion, But, uh, you know, the market doesn't look at it like that. They'll probably, the market... Uh, will value it at the if the Fed needs to revalue, reliquify a balance sheet. Uh, I, I guess they're not going to use that 42, uh, the market that is. But the problem with the U.S. gold is, um, is it really there in Fort Knox and uh, West Point, wherever it is? Uh, I, I think a lot of it has been hypothecated or lent out. <laughs> and um, to uh, the bullying banks for their paper game. Joker Alpha, are gold one ounce bars harder to prove than coins? No, I, I don't think so, but uh, they're easier to probably um, fake. It's easier to fake a, a one ounce gold bar. But as I said, you, you need to uh, buy from reputable dealers. I think that's the, the only way forward, really. Uh, great, Nate, why is Sam Bankman freed, not jailed yet? Well, because he's a creature from the, from the uh, swamp, uh, DC. That's why he's probably uh, a CIA, uh, a you know asset I would say that's why you'll probably never go to jail you'll probably disappear somewhere or I don't know uh city of London uh well it, it, uh is it in the UK uh technically no uh the city of London is um the square mile is uh sovereign 
so physically is within the UK. It's like the Vatican in Washington, D.C. So there you go. I think it's been like that since 1066 or just after that when uh, William of Normandy uh, invaded or William the Conqueror, he gave the, the city of London was already around and he gave it a uh, special status. Uh, Moonraker says the cheapest silver eagle is $38.68. Yeah, the premiums haven't really come off that much. Yeah, I mean, uh, they really did a job with, uh, they suckered in a lot of young people, Abby Shylock, with the, uh, especially the celebrities that were involved as well. And uh, I, I, they were just naive, those celebrities, because they saw the kind of people that were involved. They thought this was legitimate. And uh, usually an exchange isn't, shouldn't be that risky. And uh, no, it's just a really, I don't think it was a mistake or I think it's just a total, uh, yeah, it's just total scam, uh, FTX. And it's funny because uh, I hadn't heard of that FTX until uh, it all went uh, bad. I think it was the day of the election, November 8th, to be honest. Uh, but there, there were a few people who warned about um, FTX, I think, and I think I watched the uh, Coffee Zilla video from about six months ago, <laughs> where he showed uh, SBF being interviewed by someone else, and the guy said, "Well, you, you, you what are you talking about? Is almost like a, a Ponzi scheme." And and he said, "Well, no, because it's different because it's um, it's in crypto, <laughs> and, and um, yeah, so." There were people who warned about it. I think there's another guy who warned, I forgot his name, but if you guys go to CoffeeZilla uh, YouTube channel, you'll see. And, and this guy, he warned, uh, he, he sent information to people like Bloomberg and other uh, financial news outlet in July. And they all said, oh, we can't really look at that. Uh, uh, it, it, it is very controversial. We don't have the time. But, you know, they were receiving advertising revenue from FTX. That's why they didn't cover it. Uh, Grandma, Grandpa, sorry, Grandpa Barney, thank you for your super chat. Love your vids every morning, sir. Now, can you fix all the corruption in the U.S. stock market? Massive illegal short selling naked uh, showing, please. Well, um, I think there will always be those things in, in markets even in markets that aren't like uh, manipulated by central banks or governments. But I, I think uh, what the central banking model does, it gives too much power to a few firms and banks. And uh, yeah, and that's why there's so much corruption in the markets, I would say. And in a sound money, in the sound money system, uh, you wouldn't have to try to speculate to make a killing in the stock market. You would have sound money you could save and you could also maybe invest in your own small business. But nowadays things are so warped. They're all geared towards big corporations succeeding and the small uh, mom and pop business, individual business. Uh, we get a lot of headwinds, but uh, yeah. We got 10 minutes to go. Edward McLaughlin, I just want to check the signatures on all of the 40,330 people, people in Arizona. Not sure what that's about, Governor, uh, governor's election. Yeah, Gregory A, there is counterfeit silver. There's also uh, sovereigns actually that are counterfeit. They are gold, they're real gold coins, 
but they were minted like uh, in places like Lebanon uh, many, many years ago because gold sovereigns are known the world over. They're very popular coins. Uh, over here, it says, I can see the future being arrested for possession of precious metals, just like illegal drugs. <laughs> Anything's possible. Alan Mercek, royalty and streaming companies, they are, it says they're great. Yeah, I think they're really interesting. Uh, I, uh, I was at the uh, Precious Metals Summit conference in Zurich. And I met like an interesting CEO, uh, EMX Royalty. Uh, I bought some last week, not that much. I think it's a, a good uh, royalty company. It's still relatively small. And uh, they have a very diversified uh, portfolio of properties all over the world, EMX Royalty. It's not advice. <laughs> I'm just telling you what I did. You can look it up, though. Uh, Grow Mechanic, nice to see you. We've only got about eight minutes, though. Hey, Silver Task. Uh, for anyone, yeah, anyway, let's see. Uh, Terry Duff is CEO of CME Group called SPF out in the U.S. congressional hearing this past May. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I mean, people have been trying to warn about uh, Tether for over two years. Uh, and one day Tether is gonna go as well. Tether is uh, supposedly a stable coin back to 100% by dollars. <laughs> but we know that it's only, that it's like a, the dollar, it's like a fiat currency. It's not 100% backed by, by dollars. And uh, it's also based in the Bahamas, uh, like SB, uh, like uh, FTX was. Uh, Rich Mountain says, my great-grandfather bartered with coal his entire life for food. Land everything. He would carve it off his coal cliff and deliver it. Yeah, I mean, uh, my, uh, my, bro my brother-in-law in Switzerland, his mom, she told me that she was a little girl during the war, I guess, World War II in Switzerland. And they, they're up from the mountains. And uh, she said during World War II, uh, cheese was used a lot as money. People expect, accepted cheese for almost anything during World War II in Switzerland, at least where she, she was based. So anything can be money, really. Ed, Edward McLaughlin, Tether will be the next shoe to drop. Yeah, that will be a massive one because I think what Tether has done, it's helped inflate the market cap of the crypto world <laughs> because a, a lot of uh, people buy uh, Bitcoin and altcoins and other coins with, uh, with Tether. <laughs> And Tether is, uh, yeah, it's just a fiat crypto. It's not even a crypto. It's just a, yeah, it's not because the crypto is supposed to be something, yeah, more like Bitcoin. And Rama, what is going on with the manipulation of COMEX? Register silver to have stalled an eligible going positive. Are they being forced to reliquify due to withdrawals? I haven't really kept much track of it, uh, of this. I know the uh, registered have been, has been falling quite a bit. Maybe they are trying to reliquify, you know, put some supplies back in there, but we'll have to see. Alan Mercek thinks Bitcoin is going to 9,000 soon, $9,000.
over here, do you believe Gold Kruger and don't have any security features? Uh, why do you believe gold? Well, Kruger Rands are like <laughs> they were the most popular coins in the 70s, you know, Kruger Rands, one ounce Kruger Rands. So back then they didn't have security features. And, and there's still a lot of old uh, Kruger Rand coins from the 70s. I have a, a, a few. And when I first bought gold in 2002, uh, they were Kruger Rands that I bought. And uh, yeah, one of the good things, one of the good ways to test uh, gold and silver is to use a strong magnet and uh, gold and silver are not magnetic. So if they stick, if the magnet sticks to the coin or you know the gold or, gold or silver coin, that straight away tells you that it's not gold or silver. Yeah, I saw LG that FTX apparently bought a bank <laughs> in the US. Belly Dance Radio praying China can defeat Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff uh, out about the protests in China. I take that with a bit of a pinch of salt <laughs> because we had a lot of protests here in the West during lockdowns and stuff, but the mainstream media never covered it. Now with China, they do. Uh, another interesting thing that happened in Taiwan, they had elections there and, and uh, they vote, the, the people that they selected, the parties and the politicians, uh, they're all pro uh one, they're pro, all pro uh, one, one China policy. So uh, it, it looks like uh, all the geopolitical game going on with Russia and Ukraine and also now with Taiwan and the US, that's backfired for, for, the, uh, for the West because it looks like most Taiwanese want to be in peace with China. So yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't think uh, we'll have to see what happens in China with these protests. Uh, Grandpa Barney, thank you for your super chat. <laughs> Take the wife and Billy to lunch, my brother. Thanks for all your knowledge and helping all of us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Grandpa Barney, for your uh, super uh, generous super chat. Uh, Joker Alpha, uh, can you compare a Rolex to an Omega or Omega watch? Uh, Omega watches are nice, but uh, I think Rolexes are more, let's say Omega is probably a Mercedes Benz and uh, maybe Rolex is like a, a Bentley. <laughs> I, I'm not, yeah, or yeah, something like that. They're all, they're both nice watches though. Uh, protests in Brazil. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw a headline and I didn't read the whole story that it looks like the, the military is behind having like a, a review of, of the vote because a lot of people are upset, of course, uh, that, uh, the vote counting didn't go uh, cleanly. Again, <laughs> it, it could, and it, it, it's not just in the US that in Brazil that that's happening in the US as well. Got the thing, I think with the governor in Arizona, I haven't really kept track of that. But um, yeah, I try to focus. Uh, yeah, the, the politics is important. And I think it's a symptom of the, um, the fact that uh, they've debased our currency and our money for so long, since 1971 and even before that, and everything is uh, gone haywire because if the money and currency is like the, the blood, the lifeblood of uh, economies, and if that isn't good, the whole body uh, rots. And I think uh, all the things we see in politics, 
socially, geopolitically, economically is all a symptom of the fiat currency dying. And that's why I don't know how it's going to happen. Maybe the CBDCs will work or maybe we'll get hyperinflation. I think that would be the best choice. Uh, Alex says I'm wrong in that Omega are better. They might be better watches, but I, I think uh, Rolexes are more desirable. People prefer them. And um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think the, the watch that I really like are the Patek Philippe. They're really good. And there are some other ones, but uh, it's out of my budget, the Patek Philippe. Abby Shylock. Yeah, I did watch some of the really graceful uh, videos about SBF. Okay, so yeah, I've gone past past my time. Rolex Daytona, yeah. Um, I'll stay on a little longer. <laughs> I'll tell you about uh, Rolex Daytona. I remember back in the 90s, I have, uh, I still have the friend in, in, in Italy, and he knew someone that worked at a Rolex store in Italy. And uh, I had a, a co colleague at work, her uh, husband wanted to buy Daytona. And uh, my friend, was able to get a Daytona from the store because in the store, the, 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 the price is like the retail price. If you buy in the secondary market, it's a lot more. So I was able to get one for and the store price. And then I flew to uh, Italy for a long weekend, stayed with my friend, got the watch and sold it to uh, my colleague's uh, husband. And I made a small profit. It covered my trip. And I think I made a thousand pounds on the trade. This was when I was still working in the city. So I'm not sure you, if you can do that anymore. And at the time, I think the Daytona was 6,000 pounds <laughs> uh, to buy from the shop. And now it's probably a lot more if you can get it. it you have to go on a waiting list of years, I think, to get a Daytona from the from the from the official uh, Rolex dealer. All right. <laughs> I'll uh, wish you all uh, a good uh, rest of the weekend if you're in the US. If you are in Australia or Asia, I wish you a good Monday. And uh, if you're in the UK <laughs> and Europe, I wish you a good night and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. A Timex uh, rent cage is also a good watch.